today's going to be a fun episode because it's going to be a little bit of a different topic, something I haven't talked about a lot, but it's going to help you in business. It's going to help you in life, and it's going to show you how to save money, be in your power, and basically turn things that could be scary into really fun conversations. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Brandon Lucero, and you're about to experience the new way to thrive in business, entrepreneurship, and life by leaning into who you are, what you love, and standing up for what you want to create. Get ready, because this is where we go against the grain, say no to outdated society norms, and we say yes to change in order to create a happier, more fulfilled world. Welcome to the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast. Today we're gonna to talk about something that I find very interesting, something that I have a big passion for and something that I was absolutely scared of for a lot of years. And I think a lot of people are scared of the topic we will be talking about today, and that is negotiation. And there are so many things that we can negotiate inside of our life. And what I'm talking about today is primarily gonna be money, like when we're buying something, but there's a ton of things we can negotiate on in life, everything from, you know, um, well, let me put it this way. Negotiations could also just be another way to describe communication, communication between you and your spouse, you and your family, you and your friends, you and other people. But I'm, I'm primarily going to be talking about it in the form of money. And there's a lot of industries out there right now um, that can take advantage of people that don't know how to negotiate and are set up for you to really overpay on a lot of things if you just don't know how to negotiate or when to negotiate or what to negotiate on. And so what I wanna do in this episode is talk about how I've learned this skill and what industries in particular I have been able to negotiate and you might be able to negotiate as well to save a lot of money. So this could be related to business, this could be related to life, doesn't really matter. But the main industries or the main areas that we're gonna talk about today is how to negotiate on cars, jewelry, homes, your houses, construction jobs, like if you're remodeling, stuff like that, um, even your own job, coaching programs and stuff like that. So for me, anytime I go and buy something, I always try to negotiate. Even if I walk into a store, as long as it's not like a big brand, huge, like national brand. For example, um, I was shopping in a store in Ojai, California the other day. It's a little mom and pop shop. And there was this crystal bowl that I wanted to buy. And it was like 1100 bucks. And I was like, okay, that's really expensive. I'm not gonna pay $1,100. So I just went up to the counter and asked them, would you take $800 for this? And they said, oh, sorry, we don't, we don't barter or negotiate on pricing. I said, okay. And then another lady came in and I could tell she's kind of the manager or the owner. So I went up and started talking to her and I said, are you the owner? She said, yeah. And I said, what's the best price that you'll give me on this bowl? And she said, you know, let me think about it. And then she gave me a discount off of the bowl just because I asked and I even went to the employee and the employee told me, no, I go to the owner, the decision maker, and they're like, yeah, okay, this person's serious. They want to buy this thing. I can give them a little bit of a discount. We start to negotiate on pricing. And this happens all over the place. Now, cars are going to be the biggest one that you can save money on. And there's a lot of things that car dealerships do to try to confuse you or to try to sneak things in there. And I want to talk about what I've been able to do on my last three cars to be able to save probably almost $100,000 worth of um, pricing on our cars. I've also been able to save, I don't know off the top of my head, but a ton of money on jewelry that we've bought in, in the past couple of years. We've, I just bought a home in um, Arizona and we were remodeling and we negotiated pricing down on that. In fact, um, we got a quote for paint and the quote went from $40,000 and they were going to start like two months out to all of a sudden moving their quote to $24,000 and they were gonna start one week out. And it's because of the power of negotiation. There's different phrasings that you wanna say, there's different language that you wanna use, there's different things that go into negotiating. And so what I wanna do is I'm gonna walk you through a lot of the elements that I, I focus on. I'm gonna give you some tactics and then I'm gonna tell you some stories so you can see it all in action of how I've been able to do this over the past few years. And it has now become one of my most favorite things to do is like, I'm almost sad that I don't buy a car like every month because I love the art of negotiating. It is just, to me, it's so much fun. And I think so many people are just fear, filled with so much fear around it. So let's dive in. 
Um, the first thing is, is that we have to understand when it comes to negotiating, there's two elements that have to be blended together. If you're a listener of the podcast, this shouldn't be a surprise to you, but we like to blend the masculine and the feminine together, the yin and the yang. And so what I mean by this is I can give you all the strategies and all the tactics on what to say and how to say it and what to be aware of. But if you don't maintain your power, if you go in and you're not confident or they can tell that you're almost about to buy, they won't move, they won't budge. So the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna maintain our power. Now, I want you to understand something. As the buyer, you're in control. But so many of us go into negotiations, whether it be cars, homes, jewelry, um, even when you're like negotiating for a raise or a job, you get a job offer, you act like the person selling you is in power. But I want to flip that for a second. I want you to think about right now inside of your business, if you got on a sales call and you were selling a $10,000 package and you really wanted that sell, would you feel like the buyer was in control or you? Probably the buyer, right? Like you're really hoping that they are going to buy. You're hoping and you need their sale. Now, when you go in, you are the buyer in that situation. But so many of us, whether we're selling or we're buying, live in fear, have no confidence. For lack of a better word, I'm going to say weak. That's not the right word. Um, I mean, let me say powerless. That's a that's a much better word. Powerless. Not you're not weak. You're powerless. Most of us go in powerless. So whether we're selling a high end ticket program or we're selling a program or we're selling someone into our service, we're like, oh my gosh, I hope they buy. I hope they buy. I hope they buy. And then on the flip side, if we go and buy a car, you're like, oh my gosh, I just hope I can get the car. I hope they can meet me in the price. And and you don't know what to do or what to say. So the first part, whether you're buying or selling, is you have to understand your power. And it's the same thing even when you're pitching and selling. That's still a negotiation. When I go to sell, it is a take it or leave it mentality. I'm not going to bend on the price unless I have a good reason or something for it. Um, when I first started out and I was $40,000 in debt, we did our first coaching program. There were people that tried to negotiate and I would work with them a little bit because I needed the money. But now after years of working on myself, my own power, understanding my value, there is no flexibility. It is what it is. And sometimes you get people that try to negotiate um, and sometimes, you know, they're successful and sometimes they're not. I will say though, one of the only times, this is me going off on a tangent. One of the only times I think I've ever come off of my price is when someone offered to pay our coaching program all in cash for a discount. That was one time I was like, okay, <laughs> I think we can work something out. But the first thing of the element we need is that invisible element, which is maintain your power. So the first thing that we need to go through in maintaining our powers. First of all, understand when you go to sell someone something, you're probably nervous and you hope that they buy. When you're the buyer, that seller should be feeling the same way about you because every business needs money. Every person needs income. And most salespeople, their income is driven off of commission, meaning that if they don't make a sale with you, they don't get paid. So when you go in and again, it does not matter what you're buying. If you're buying a home, you're buying a car, you're buying jewelry, all of those people are paid off of commission, which means they literally make money when they make a sale. So they're gonna try to make the sale. They will work with you within the realm of, of what they can, but they're also gonna try to get the most that they can out of it. But you have to understand they want you and they need you in order to survive to buy whatever they're selling. They need you. And quite honestly, they need you more than you need them because whatever they're selling, there's probably multiple dealerships, multiple jewelry stores, there's multiple options for you to go and purchase things. Okay, so that's the first thing you have to understand. The next thing you have to understand is you have to lose attachment to whatever you're buying, which means when you lose attachment to whatever you're buying, it gives you the ability to walk out. It gives you the ability to easily leave the dealership, leave the store, leave the conversation, leave the negotiation. And when you leave the negotiation, the sense of urgency to the person selling goes up. Even with a car dealership, they know that, I forget the actual percentage, but it's a huge amount of people that when they leave the dealership, they never actually end up buying the car. I think it's like 80% or something. Jeff, do you know what the number is? It's close to that, yeah. 80%? It's like 80%. So 80% 80 of the people that leave the dealership when talking about a car, negotiating a car, they never come back. So it's in their best interest to keep you there. And so you want that conversation 
open. But what happens is a lot of people start to get emotional. They really like it. That's why they have you test drive. They show you all the features They get you in the car. They get you hooked emotionally. If you're working with a really good car salesman, they'll build rapport with you, which means that they find ways to connect with you, find things in common that you might have. They will ask you a lot of questions to figure out why you want this car. They will develop an emotional relationship with you. They will find the emotional reasons of why you want the car. If they're a good salesperson, that's what they'll do. So you have to keep that in mind. Okay, so keep that in mind is that's what they're going to do. They're going to try to keep you there and they're going to try to build a relationship with you. And honestly, any good salesperson should be doing that. But if you lose attachment, no emotional attachment, complete lose attachment to the car, it makes it very easy for you to get up and walk out. And that is going to be a huge negotiation tool that we'll talk about later. But you have to be able and be willing to leave and know that either no one's going to buy the thing that you want, you can always come back later, or you can find it somewhere else or something better will pop up. Okay. So when you lose attachment, you maintain your power. This also allows you to stabilize your emotions. If you want to be a good negotiator, you have to get out of your emotions. That means getting out of your fear, getting out of your worry, getting out of your wants, getting out of your desires, getting out of all of that. And we want to look at the numbers. Okay. So in step number one, maintain your power. This is one of those feminine, invisible things, the things you can't really see. It's not tangible. You can't touch it. It's not a tactic. It's a state of energy. It's a state of being. We want you going in powerful. We want you going in without attachment, without any emotional connection. And I want you to be able to just look at the numbers. Okay. That also leads us to number three is you have to be confident. If you're going in, going in there and watch and be aware of your language, things like, can you please lower the price to this? Not There's no confidence and you're begging them to do you a favor. Instead, they should be doing favors for you. So when you have confidence, you start to say things like, look, I know that you guys just gave us a discount, but honestly, I can't get it. I can't do that. I can do the $30,000 price point. And that's confidence. There's honesty. I'm standing up for the numbers that I want. And I'm not begging them. I'm letting them know, here's my boundary. Here's where I'm at. Look, I know that you guys came down. I can't make those numbers work. So if you want this car sold, we have to be able to work on this number. Okay. So when we have the loss of attachment, we have more power and we have the confidence. It takes this begging away. It stops this like idea that the person selling us something is doing us a favor. You're doing them a favor by buying. Do you guys understand that? They are, or you are doing them a favor. They should not be doing you any favor. So don't act like that. Be confident and be firm on your pricing and your negotiations and just your entire communication and your uh, energy. Now, this doesn't mean be rude and be mean. You still want to be able to build rapport to the person you're selling. Like if you treat them like a jerk, trying to be tough, and remember, I didn't, tough was never something I said. You don't want to be tough. You want to be firm and you want to stick to your boundaries and your prices. You want to build rapport with them just like they're building rapport with you. Okay. So some of the best negotiations that I've had are when I was almost friends with the person that I was selling with and it becomes a much easier conversation. The next one is patience. I think this is the next tool that a lot of people don't have when it comes to negotiations is patience. Do your research, shop around, educate yourself. The last thing you want to do when you're walking into uh, a car dealership is just to walk in and then buy a car then and there. If you haven't looked around, you haven't gotten quotes from multiple people, you haven't talked to any of the salespeople, uh, you haven't looked at, again, at other dealerships or same thing with jewelry. You haven't looked around at jewelry. You don't know what the price of gold is. You don't know what the price of platinum is. You don't know any of that stuff. And you go in, you're completely at the liberty of whatever the salesperson tells you. And sometimes they're not very honest. Sometimes there are people that will straight up lie to you about things. So that's the next one is, is patience. You have to feel the market. You have to know that the good, when the, you can't find a good deal, it will change. Markets change all the time. So a good example of this is the car market right now. Two years ago, three years ago, the car market was completely different than what it is now. Even uh, the car market now is still, it's not great right now, but it's still better than it was you know, two years ago. Okay, so you have to know the market, be patient, understand that the good deal will come. If the good deal doesn't come, just walk away. It will happen at some point. Okay, same thing with homes. When you're looking for a home, understand the market, look at other homes being sold, look at the comps. Don't depend just on your real estate agent to give you the best information. Right now, we're looking at um, 
Flagstaff, Arizona, because that's where we're moving. And I was looking at homes and the market has been absolutely bananas in Flagstaff. And um, the prices kept going up and up and up and up and up. And I started to do my own research. I started to favor things on Redfin and look and get updates. And I would get notified when homes would get listed and when they would move their pricing down. And I started to realize over the last 30 days, a lot of homes in Flagstaff were getting listed and doing price decreases. Well, guess what? That wasn't happening three, four months ago. So now what I'm realizing is the market's slowing down in Flagstaff. I didn't need my real estate agent to tell me that. I knew that just by doing my own research, studying the market. The more educated you are on the market, the more power you have in negotiations. Because here's the deal. If I go in to negotiation with a real estate agent and I, I say, hey, here's the list price. I'm going to go underneath the list price and I'm going to offer you $50,000 less. And they came to me and said, you know, the market is so high right now. This is, the, this is one of the highest markets that we've seen in the last five years. I don't think they're going to go lower. If I was not educated, I would probably go, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go to the list price. And if I was emotionally attached to the house, I would say, yeah, I'd probably go with the list price. But if I lost attachment to the house, I knew the market was coming down. I could respond with something like, well, I do know that, yeah, it is pretty high right now. But I also know that there have been at least 15 homes that have been listed at list price and have come down and still are on the market and aren't selling. I also know that the average price of a home sold used to be three days and it's now 15. So you can wait if someone's gonna give you list price or you guys can sell it right now for 50,000 under and then see what they say. But I've, and I didn't rely on my own agent to give that type of response. And again, I know I'm using real estate, but this could be any industry. So if you're going to buy something of value and you're gonna invest in it and it's gonna be a high, whatever, a high purchase or a good paying job, be patient, understand the market, understand your options so you can use that to your advantage. And again, that comes down with patience. You need to wait. Number three, four, the next step is to find any leverage you can. So leverage is really easy to do um, with cars. And again, this market, the car market right now, is a little crazy because of COVID and the supply chain and all that stuff. So a lot of the things I'm gonna say about cars may not be relevant in this exact moment, but they will at some point, and they were three, three years ago. But even now, when I bought my um, dream truck, I bought a, a TRD Pro um, Tacoma, and uh, I had to find leverage in order to negotiate down on the price. Because right now, car dealerships really aren't negotiating that much. Like barely, if you, if you can get them to negotiate anything, you're probably doing pretty well. But you have to be able to find that leverage, okay? So when I went, um, I think it was back in 2018, I bought a, or leased a Jaguar F-Type R. And I think the list price on it was like 125,000. And I ended up getting it for, I think like 95 or 90,000 or something like that. And the only reason I was able to get it to that, that low of a price point was because I had leverage and I was patient and I knew the pricing of other F-types in the area. In fact, I had found, I realized the one exact one that I wanted was at the Newport dealership. I did some research on it and I had been watching it for six months. I've been watching it sit there on their lot for six months, which for cars is a really long time. In fact, it could have even been there even longer because I only noticed it. And once I noticed it, it had been there for six months. So who, know how, who knows how long it was sitting there before I uh, even got there. Here's also something that people won't tell you. When you go to look at cars, you can open that front door and on the door jam of usually, it's usually the driver side of the, uh, of the car. There's a sticker with like the VIN number, the um, information of the car. It'll also tell you the manufacturing date of the car like when it was made. And usually from the time the car is made to when it's on the lot is like a couple months. So you can look at the manufacturer date of a car that's sitting on a lot and then do some quick math and get an estimated time of how long it's actually been on the lot. Okay, so the longer a car has been on the lot, the more likely you are to be able to get a lower price because they just wanna move, move it off their lot. So when I went to go find that leverage, I looked at all the dealerships and I found one uh, where they had a exact same car in white. I wanted the black one. The black one was the one I was eyeballing. And so when I went into the dealership, that was my negotiation tool. Because I told them, here it is on the website. I hadn't even gone into the dealership yet, but this is the price they have listed on their website. It's the exact same car, except it's in white. If you don't match their price or give me a better deal, I'm gonna walk over there today, because it was Huntington Beach or whatever, it's just down the road. 
and I'm going to buy that one. I want this one. I was honest with them. I want this one, but I'm not going to pay 25,000 extra dollars just to have a black car versus a white one. What do you guys want to do? And we went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I eventually got them down to the price that I wanted. And it was very simple. I had would probably would not have been able to get them to that low of a price had I not had the leverage. Also, had I not known that that car had been sitting on the lot for six months, I probably wouldn't have been able to get that low of a price. So it happened because I had leverage. The paint uh, remodel that we have going on right now, they quoted us $40,000. $40, I got them down to $24,000. How? Multiple quotes. I had leverage. I said, I don't care who paints my house. There's one person quoting me this and one person quoting me that. And um, they said, well, the quality of what we use is probably higher than what they use. And then I just told them, this is going to be an Airbnb eventually. I don't really care the quality of the paint. I care more about the price. So do you want the deal or not? So what do you think they did? They lowered the price. Again, you have to be able to take away their objections as well. So they're going to come at you with higher materials in the 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 and when they come at you with things like that like higher materials better quality you have to be able to take that away from from them and i'll show you a couple ways to do that on today's episode so again leverage you need multiple quotes um and you need to if you're going to take a loss on other things too by going with them you need to make them aware of that there's been times when i negotiated my truck and i was doing a trade-in and taking a loss on the trade-in so i said if i'm going to take a loss on the trade-in you guys have to do better on this price i've been able to do things like that as well okay and time too so you have to be able to use your time as a, a thing of leverage as well so you could say things like hey this paint company is going to do it in two weeks are you going to be able to beat them and come in this week so it's not necessarily about the price. It's also how soon can they start? How soon can they get things done? How, how soon can you start the job? How much time are they going to give you to before you start? There's You can use time as a negotiation tool as well. It's not just about price all the time. So again, let's recap what we have so far. The elements I love using are maintaining my power and losing attachment, taking care of emotions. Number two is speaking with confidence, even if I don't feel confident. Number three is being patient and understanding the market, doing my research. So I have more, um, uh, I have a bigger arsenal to go into negotiations. I'm just more aware of what's going on in the market, which limits the chance that they're going to take advantage of me. So the more you research you do, the less someone can take advantage of you because you're just more educated and aware. Number uh, four is you need to find leverage, okay? So whether it's a better price somewhere else, multiple quotes is a great way to do this. Using time, this person's going to start sooner. Can you beat that? Or can you lower your price because it's going to cost me two weeks if I go with this other company versus you guys, so things like that. If you're going to take a loss, like if you're doing a trade-in on something, you can use that as a power of, of leverage as well. But if you want the best price, you have to find some leverage somewhere. And I'll give you some stories of how I've been able to do this in the past. Next is know your market. Okay. So I, we talked about this already, but I'm going to give you some standards right now. Jewelry. You should never buy a piece of jewelry from a store unless you're getting at least 20% off from my experience. 20% uh, off to 30% off is pretty normal. I personally would never buy a piece of jewelry at the price of whatever's listed under the counter. And I personally would never buy a piece of jewelry that was a not at least 20% off of that price. That is totally normal. The markup on jewelry is absolutely insane. So understand that going in when you go to buy jewelry. If you're going to buy jewelry, you should be getting at least 20 to 30% off of whatever the tag price is or whatever they originally tell you. And they will do everything they can to try to get you to come up. Now, I'll give you a story about this. I'll tell you now. I'll probably tell you at the end of the podcast too. So we just and actually just recently bought some jewelry for uh, my wife for her anniversary. And it was uh, two pieces of, of jewelry. So I bundled two things together to get a better discount. And they came back and they said the price is going to be like, it was like $12,000 or something like that. I said, okay, well, what's the best price you guys can do if I buy both of them today? And they said, they said, well, I'll give you, I'll bring it down to 10000 500. That's the best we can do. 10,500. And I said, no, how about 9,500? If you guys do 9,500, I'll do it today. And they said, ah, we can't do 9,500. And I said, I'll pay all cash. And they said, okay, well maybe we'll, which is another negotiation tactic is you can, you can pay all cash that 
if you have the cash, pay all cash because you always get the best deal in, in most cases. So then they brought it down to, to 10,000. And I said, no, 9,500 is the number that I can do. And they uh, talked about it, came back and they said, no, 10,000 is the best we can do. And I said, look, I'm going to leave right now and I'm going to go to a different dealer uh, jewelry store. And there's a big one out here in Ventura County. Um, I think it's called, uh, what is it called? Cotier or something. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Some other place out here in Ventura that's really well known. I said, like, I, I don't care who I buy this from. We will find another piece of jewelry somewhere else. And I'm literally going to walk out this door and I'm going to go to a different place and buy it because you guys don't want to come down 500 more dollars. And they said, OK, we can come down, but we need you to come up. So how much can you come up is the way they phrased this question to me. And I said, I already did come up. And they're like, what do you mean you already came up? You, you said 9,500, you haven't budged. And I said, my budget coming in was 7,500. I've already come up $2,000 for you guys to get as close as I can to that price. So again, I'm maintaining my power. I have confidence. I know the market. I know what 30% off of the jewelry looked like. I knew all of those numbers coming in. And then I knew what they were doing is they were trying to get me to come up by naming a price, thinking that they were doing me a favor. And I reframed it as I'm already doing you a favor because I am already coming up in price by $2,000. And I said, and if you don't want to do the 9,500, I will literally walk out this door and I will leave. And again, I'm, I did exactly everything I laid out for you guys here. And guess what they did? They came back and said 9,500, done deal. And they're still making money, which is crazy. They originally quoted uh, over $12,000, brought it down to 95, and you know they're still making money. That should show you how marked up jewelry actually is. There was another case when I bought a ring and the ring, uh, I had to get a, a custom ring made for some spiritual stuff, is actually a spiritual tool. And they originally quoted me nine grand. I told them, yeah, I think that should work. I told them the next day, no, I'm not going to do it. I can't, I can't pay that, that price. I can't afford it is what I told them. Could I afford it? Yes. Did I think it was way overpriced? Uh-huh. So I didn't pay it. And then what they did on the same phone call says, you know what? I'll drop it down to six. Can you do six? And I said, yeah, I think I can do six. And just like that, in one second to the another, a drop of $3,000, that's like over 33 or 30%, it's like 33% that they dropped just because I was about to walk out the door. Okay, so know the market, know what you're getting yourself into. The next step is also figuring out what they want. This is huge, with, especially with car dealerships. Uh, and I've learned this through all the different negotiations and talking. And again, I ask questions. Even after I sign a deal, I talk to the salesperson. I said, could I have gotten lower? What is really the best price? Why did it happen this way? Why did your manager tell me this? And I asked them questions and I find out that sometimes some dealerships would rather have a lease than a sale of a car. Knowing that information can be very helpful, especially as a business owner, because we could lease and we could buy the car. We could ride it off both ways. Especially as a business owner, I think if it's a car or a truck that's over a certain amount of weight, you can actually write off the purchase of a, of a car or a truck and not have to lease it. So again, talk to your CPA if you're a business owner on a lot of that stuff as well. But also, you just want to figure out what they want. Sometimes, you know, when I walk into a lot of jewelry shops and I tell them I can pay all cash, their tone completely changes. Figure out what they want. Is there jewelry that hasn't been moved in a while? Ask them, how long has this piece been sitting here? How long have you guys had this in, in stock? They will tell you those things. And if it's been there for two years, guess what? They probably want to move it. So ask questions. The next step is to understand the numbers. If you do not understand the numbers, you will get a taken advantage, advantage of, especially when it comes to cars. The number one thing that they're going to use to try to negotiate you and take the most amount of money from you when buying a car is they're gonna ask you what your monthly payment is. And the reason they ask this is because they focus on the monthly payment, not the sale price of the car. And you get totally screwed by this. So if you negotiate off this, the price of the car, you end up saving more money in the long run. Same thing when people buy homes, they usually, in loans, when you get a loan and a mortgage, people do not understand the numbers and they can get taken advantage of. When you go in to finance anything, know your numbers, know the rates of what your interest is, look around, shop around, can you get a better interest rate somewhere else? So understand the numbers, especially when it comes to cars. Okay. All right. So those are my elements. Those are my elements of, of things that you need in order to become a powerful negotiator. So let's recap real quick before we move in to some tactics. 
So first thing you want is you want the comp or the power. So maintain your power, uh, lose all the attachments, the emotional attachments, um, stabilize your, your emotions, know that the good deal will come, have the confidence. Even if you're scared and out, scared out of your mind, speak in confidence. Um, do not act like they are doing you a favor or yeah, don't get them to do you a favor. You want to be doing them a favor, um, and act like you're always doing them a favor. Remember when I told you that story about the jewelry, I said, I'm already coming up $2,000 to meet you guys here. I frame that as I'm doing you a favor by even offering the 9,500 price. So what do you guys want to do? Uh, next one is patience. Shop around, understand the market, feel the market understand what you're getting yourself into, look at different options, which also could give you more leverage, which is the next step. So look for uh, different quotes from different people, different price points, talk to different people. Um, if you're looking for a job, like maybe get multiple job offers, feel the market out, understand what you're getting yourself into, what other all your options are. If you have to take a loss on buying this, on buying whatever it is, let them know, use that to your advantage. And then time is another thing you can use for leverage. If someone's willing to get started sooner or get you something faster, that is a great tool to use for negotiation when talking to people. You know, it's like, well, this person said they could have the card delivered in a month. Can you beat that? Yes, no. So you can use time as leverage. Next one is know your market. The jewelry market, you should probably be getting 20 to 30% off. Um, cars, you should always be getting a discount off the price of a car. This market is different. Um, sometimes that's not totally possible right now. And I'll talk about that here in a second. Cause when I bought my truck, it was a Toyota Tacoma TRD Pro. I bought it a year ago, like right in the middle of the supply chain thing. Like it was very hard to get this truck. So Toyota actually started doing markups on all their truck. The one in particular that, that I bought, they had a $10,000 markup. So it was the original sticker price plus an extra $10,000. Um, so I got them to remove that $10,000, which is damn near impossible at the time when we, um, when I bought it, it was like the third dealership I went into and I tried to negotiate with the first two people and they, they're basically, no, no. They're like either buy it or don't, this car will be sold the next day. And it was, that's, that's the market. But somehow I was able to get them to go down $10,000 and I'll talk, I'll tell you that story and how I was able to do that. So know the market, figure out what they want. Sometimes car dealerships will want leases versus sales and vice versa. Um, sometimes jewelry stores might want to move a piece of jewelry and you can bundle things together. They're always going to want cash. Um, figure out what they want, ask them questions, have a, a conversation with them and then understand your numbers. Remember, especially with cars, you want to negotiate off the price. You do not want to negotiate off the monthly price. That's how they get you because they take your focus completely off of what the actual sale price of the car is. Okay. So here's some tactics. When negotiating, number one, if you can afford it, pay in cash always. You will always get the best deal when you pay in cash, especially with smaller stores. Um, I'm not going to tell you why, but I mean, if you're a business owner, I'm sure you understand why people want to uh, pay in cash or want to take cash. I'll just leave it at that. But cash will always get you the best deal. Sometimes bigger companies, bigger companies usually won't care about cash. Like if you walk into a car dealership, they really don't care if you pay in cash or not. Like a big one, like Toyota. If you walk into like a small used car dealership, maybe like all cash. Jewelry stores for sure. The smaller ones like mom and pop ones or, or smaller jewelry stores that aren't chains will usually um, give you a much better deal if you pay in cash. Uh, contractors, same thing. If you pay all cash, they usually will give you a better deal. Um, even with coaching programs, we've had people come to us and offer to pay our coaching program all in cash for a discount. And I've done that. I've actually done that where someone literally paid us all in cash for our coaching program uh, in order to get a discount. I have done that in the past. You might be able to do it as well with, with some people. It never hurts to ask. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind is it never hurts to ask when you're trying to negotiate. Tactic number two, never be the first one to give out a number. Okay. So you always want to see what their lowest number is first, and then you start negotiating off of their lowest number. Never give a number first. So when I went in and was negotiating with our Yukon, the first question she asked me was, what's your monthly payment? And I said, honestly, I don't really care about the monthly payment. I could afford any monthly payment that you give me. I said, what I'm more concerned about is what is the final price of that car? And she looked at me in the eyes and goes, oh, this is going to be fun, isn't it? And I said, yep, <laughs> because she knew all of those tactics weren't going to work on me because I was educated. I understand the power of 
negotiating. And it was a very fun negotiation. Um, I got them to go, I think $17,000 off the sticker price of, of the car. And I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So do not give a monthly price. Even if they ask you that, do not be the first one to give a price, especially with a car. Just say, I want to hear what your best deal is. And then you start negotiating off of the best deal. Okay. Same thing with jewelry, same thing with everything. When you do give your number, you give the number as if you are doing them a favor. So remember when I told you that story about the jewelry, the 95, I acted like I was coming up off of my budget. And I did, I had a budget of $7,500. I did not expect to pay that much money. So I let them know that. So when I go to negotiate, I act like when I lowball them or give the best price or, or give them a price underneath what, what they said their best price was, I act like I'm doing them a favor. Like, ugh, I don't really wanna go this high, but I could probably do this price. I can't do more than that. Because look, guys, they're gonna do the same thing to you. They're gonna be like, oh, this is my lowest price. I am sorry, like I'm, my manager said this is the lowest we can go. I'm really trying to get like my manager to go lower. He just won't budge. And you say, oh, that's too bad because the highest I can go is this price. So use the same tactic back on them. Every salesperson is going to tell you this is their lowest price. So you need to start telling them this is your highest price. Okay, that's one, another tactic. Tactic number four, walk away towards the leverage. So if you have leverage, a better price, a better quote, tell them, ah, I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to go with the other one and be okay walking away. Sometimes they'll say, hold on, let's talk about this. And sometimes they'll just let you walk. And sometimes when they let you walk, they'll call you up an hour later or the next day. And sometimes they won't. And, and if you really want that car or that piece of jewelry or whatever it is, you could go back. But what you could also do is take whatever price they gave you and use it at leverage at the next dealership. Okay, so you get to use that thing you walked away from as the leverage, as more leverage for the next deal you walk into. Okay, the next one is, it could be a little, you know, how you want to look at it, ethical, unethical, but I call it the cold feet agree. <laughs> so I made my own method of, of, of stuff when it comes to negotiation. Basically, it's when you say, yeah, I think I can do that. And then I need to talk to my wife or let me think about it or I'll, I'll, I'll come back tomorrow or I'll send the payment. So you agree to it and you walk away and you come back and go, you know what? I thought about it. I can't do that. So you get the salesperson thinking they have the deal and that it's a done deal and you come back with cold feet. And sometimes that will be enough to get them to lower the price more. I did this with the ring when they quoted me nine grand. I said, OK, yeah, I think I can do that and I will send the payment tomorrow called them back up and said, you know, I talked to my wife and I think it's a little high. I don't think we can do that. And they said, well, what price can you do? And I told them um, five grand. They came back at six and I said, okay, great. Let's do, let's do six. And I got them to go $3,000 off just by using that one tactic. So the cold feet agree. And then you go back. Uh, tactic number six is just to build rapport. If you're on the lot with someone and you're going to buy a car, you're going to be with them for a few hours. Build rapport. And when you build rapport, they're usually more likely to drop more info that you can use to your advantage. You know, you could you could talk to them about, well, what does your car dealership want right now? What are you guys really like? How can I make this deal work? And sometimes they'll tell you and sometimes they won't. But the chances of them telling you information that would be good for you to know goes up when you have rapport built with that person. Same thing with the jewelry store, especially if they um, are the salesperson and not really the manager. What do you think your manager would do? Would they like this price? Would they not like this price? What are you guys trying to sell more of? How long has this been in the case? How long have you guys had this here? The more rapport you build with them, the more likely they are to reveal things that uh, you could use to your advantage. In order to help build rapport, the next tactic is um, using their language. So you can use their language in multiple ways. Using their language and repeating back things that they say helps you build rapport. So if someone is using the word, um, I don't know, like uh, totally wicked. I don't know why it's the first thing that came up in my mind. Totally wicked. And you start using the word totally wicked. That's a that's from Massachusetts, like the Massachusetts Boston area thing, right? Like, it's not totally wicked, but just wicked. Wicked. Okay, so wicked, the word wicked. And, and you start using it too. There's a subconscious rapport that is being built. And so if you start to use their language, their tones, their words, you have kids, they have kids, you just start to find these commonalities. But the way I like to use language in combination with that is I like to flip it so I put them in my shoes. So when I was negotiating on our Yukon, I was actually using a Tahoe as leverage. So if you guys know that Yukon and the Tahoe are, they're the same car. One's made by GMC and the other one's made by Chevy. But the GMC dealerships will tell you the Yukon is more expensive because it's a higher quality car, which 
personally, I think it's BS. I think it probably comes from the same factory. They just slap different stickers on it is my guess. I don't know that to be true, but, but either way, it's like eight to $10,000 more. And I remember talking to the manager, negotiating down the price. And I said, you know what? I don't like this price. I'm just going to go with the Tahoe because it's going to save me $8,000. And he said, it's just $8,000. You're going to really try to save $8,000 and have a lower quality car that could cost you more in repairs and things like that. And I told him, I'm like, I'm doing a lease. It's two years. I don't think there's gonna be a lot of, a lot of leases, repairs done in the next two years. And he said, but it's $8,000 to have a higher quality car. And I said, yeah, but it's my money. Are you going to pay that $8,000 for me? Is it coming out of your pocket? And he just said, no. And I said, would you pay $8,000 right now? Is that a lot of money to you? Is, or is it not a lot of money? He's like, well, yeah, it's a lot of money. I said, exactly. So that's why I'm going to go with the Tahoe. So I start to put them in my shoes. If someone says, if I said I'm going to go talk to my spouse and they start talking me out of not talking to my spouse, I would say, would you make a decision on this big of a purchase without talking to your spouse? Are you willing to go talk to my spouse if I get in trouble, if they get mad at me? And the answer is usually going to be no. So you start to put them in your shoes and it takes away a lot of their power when negotiating. Again, you can only do that if you're in your power the whole time. Okay. Uh, the next one, I have found this to be true with almost every single negotiation I have ever done. If you are not negotiating with the manager or the owner, you're not getting the best price. You're just not. And if the, if the, um, and yes, the people, the salesperson will usually go out there and ask their manager or ask the salesperson. But I found it to be true that if if they can go lower on a piece of jewelry or a car or something and they don't want to go as low as they they can, the manager will come out and start doing a lot of the negotiating. What I found that to be true on cars. I found that to be true on um, jewelry. Back before COVID, when I was negotiating on the Yukon, I got $17,000 off the price of the Yukon. At the end of the negotiation, I was negotiating directly with the manager, not the salesperson anymore. When I went and bought my um, F-Type and I had that amazing leverage of the other one and a different dealership, I was not, by the end of it, I was talking to the manager directly. I was not talking to the salesperson anymore. And the salesperson wasn't talking to me and then checking with the manager. I was talking directly to the actual manager. Again, it's a different market now, but so I don't know how it's gonna work nowadays. But on last year, and even when I bought my truck, the manager ended up coming out and talking to me. So unless you're talking directly to the manager, you might not be getting the best deal. Again, that's not always true, but I found that to be true on the last three cars that I have bought. I've also found it to be true with jewelry. Um, and I found it to be true, I guess, with, with, those, with those two areas. So your goal is to eventually be negotiating with the manager or the owner because they have more power in the price. And usually the manager, the owner is probably the best negotiator, the best salesperson, which is why they're in that position in the first place. Okay. So those are the tactics and those are the elements that you need for negotiations. So let me talk to you about a couple times when I've used these and just show you how this works. So the first one is going to be when I got my Jaguar and I gave you guys um, kind of the overview already. There was one that I wanted. There was a list price of 115 or 125,000. I saw another one, the exact same car in white at like 90,000 at a different dealership. So I went in, negotiated mine down to basically almost the same exact price. I think I got it for 93, but I still saved over $30,000 off of it. And by the end of it, I was talking to the manager. They tried everything. They tried, because I was leasing it. They tried looking at my lease payment. Well, what if we got your lease payment to this price? And I said, no, I don't care about the lease payment. I want this price on the car. Because here's how, le here's how leases work, if you guys don't know. The way leases work is they look at what is the sale price of the car. Because when you lease a car, you're technically buying it and there is a sale price of the car. And then what they're going to do is they're going to say at the end of the lease, this is our estimated value of the car. So let's say um, I, I buy the car for 100000 They tell me the price of the car when the two-year lease is up is going to be 75000 That's a difference of $25,000. What they do is they take that $25,000 and they divide it by two years, so months, so 24 months, and that becomes your lease payment. That's how they, that's how they uh, work the numbers, okay? So what you, you can't, I haven't found uh, a scenario where you can negotiate the, the, I think it's the residual price, the price of the car um, 
when the end of lease is done that they don't really negotiate that. That's, I think that's just more of a system that pumps out a number. I think, I don't, I don't know, but what you can do is you can negotiate the price that you're purchasing the car at, but they're going to try to get you on lease payments. What is the payment you want? Don't look at that. Look at the final price. So when I went in, what I did is I went in and told them I was going to buy the car and I said, I'm going to buy the car. I want to match that price. And then they agreed to the price. And then I said, you know what? What does this look like as a lease? And then now they didn't know I was going to lease the car. So they thought I was buying the car. So I ended up getting a better price because I wasn't, they didn't think I was leasing it. And I talked about the final price, the final price, the final price. Then I said, let's look at the lease. And they're like, oh, you wanted to lease this? And I said, yep. And they go, oh, uh, okay. And so they actually tried to get me to go up on the price again. So we agreed on 93 and they tried to move it to like 95 or 97. I was like, no, you guys, <laughs> you guys gave me a price of 93. We're going to lease it at that price. So again, um, I had the leverage. I maintained my power. I was talking to the manager and I knew my numbers and I knew what was going on. The same thing with the Yukon. I told him I wasn't really looking at, at Yukons. I was looking at more Tahoes because of the better pricing. Uh, I knew my price. I knew the price of the Tahoe. I already went in and got a price and a quote on the Tahoe. And I used that as my leverage. I started talking to the sales rep person I was working with. And she said that uh, they wanted, they were trying to get more leases right now. So I knew that if I started with a lease that they would uh, probably give me a better deal. And then by the end of it, I was talking to the manager. I got them to come down $17,000. I did not budge. I used all the tactics we had here and I got them to lease the Yukon to me at $17,000 off the, the purchase price. With my house, the house that we bought, we actually just sold it. We bought it in 2000. 19, like six months before COVID hit. And we, I didn't really like the house. Uh, my wife did, but it was all original and it had been on the market for like three months with zero offers. So that's great research. That's great intel to know. We went, we saw the house, it was big, it needed to be remodeled. So um, we knew people weren't really looking at it because it was just all original. And I noticed that the furniture wasn't in the, in the, in the house which tells me those people are paying rent and a mortgage somewhere else, plus the mortgage on this house. They haven't had any offers in three months. We can probably get a good deal. They were asking 850. They had moved it to 825, still no offers. Then they moved it to, to 800, still no offers. And then we we threw in a low ball offer at 750 and we landed on 770. And so we originally got the house for $80,000 under what they were asking pre-COVID. And obviously it's gone way up in value since then. And I used that to my advantage. I looked around, I knew the numbers. I looked at, there's no furniture in the house. Here's the market. You know, homes in this area are not staying on the market for three months, but this one is. So they probably are getting a little bit desperate. They keep lowering the price. So we got a good deal on it. I told you guys the stories about the ring that I bought and the jewelry for my wife. The biggest story there is that we had to get them to meet us at our price. Again, I was not looking at this as, um, they're giving me a discount. I'm looking at this as here's my top bar. Are you going to meet me there or not? Okay. And then we negotiated from that point. Now here's the story that I do want to tell you, because this is how I was able to get our, tr my truck and get that $10,000 thing wiped off. Okay. So this one's kind of a funny story, uh, but this will be the last story before we wrap up. I wanted a Tacoma TRD pro. I went into three, two different dealerships. They would not budge off of the price. They wouldn't do it. And they just basically told me that if the if I don't buy it, someone else will in the next day or two. And they were right. Like they were selling like hotcakes. So what I did is I went into the third dealership and I noticed that they had two TRD pros, which was really rare. They had two of the exact same truck. And I said, well, maybe just maybe because there's two of them, they will be a little bit more lenient at lowering the price to try to move them quickly. So I went in and I asked and they they did. They took twenty five hundred dollars off that price. But I was just from what I want to do, like my own standards is just, I'm not going to pay over sticker price for a car. I'm not, not going to do it. So I told them you have to knock this whole, this whole thing off and they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. And I had my Jaguar and I didn't put all my cards on the table when we first went in. I wouldn't do that if I were you either. And I said, what if I trade in the Jag? And I said, honestly, I'm going to take a loss on the Jag because what I have left on the lease and what it's worth I have, I owe more on the car than what it's worth. And I know that because I bought it new. And I said, what if I trade in the Jaguar? So they said, well, let's do some numbers. So they did some numbers and they came back. And what they did is they had bundled all the numbers together in one final price. And they said, here's what you're going to owe to give us the Jaguar. And here's what you're going to owe um, 
on the truck. So they gave me one price and I don't remember what that price was, but I started digging into the numbers and I had to really dig in and I realized there was one line where it said, here's the estimated value of what we're, or here's the value of what we're giving you for the Jaguar. And they bundled it in so deep in the paperwork that you wouldn't see it unless you're carefully looking for it. And I realized that the price they were giving me was way below, it was like $45,000. And I probably could have traded it in somewhere else for like 55. So they were like undercutting me about $11,000 and told me I owed them um, a huge amount of money to buy this truck. And I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. We need to raise the price of the value of the Jaguar up. So they go back in and they come back with another price. And it was still way under what they should be giving me for the Jaguar. And I said, you know what? You guys are really, really kind of screwing me on this Jaguar. You need to take that full $10,000 off. So they come back and they go, okay, we'll take the full $10,000 off of this truck. And then what we're going to do is we're gonna give you this price for the Jaguar. And I said, great, I will do that. I will pay a little bit more, like take a bigger loss on the Jaguar if you take that $10,000 off the thing. And they said, great. I said, so here's what I need you to do. I don't want this as one deal. I want these as two separate deals. I'm gonna do the Jaguar as a separate deal and do that as a sale to you guys in a separate deal. I don't want this bundled together. And then I'm gonna do the Tacoma with the $10,000 off on a separate deal. And they're like, why do you wanna do that for? Why do you wanna do that? And I said, because if I bundle it together, I can't write off the loss of the Jaguar, but I can if it's a separate deal. And they go, oh, okay, makes sense. So what they did is they, and I said, let's sign the paperwork for the Tacoma. So I signed all the paperwork for the Tacoma. I bought the Tacoma. We came back to the table and we're ready to do the Jaguar deal. And I said, you know what? This is not a great price on the Jaguar. I said, you guys need to come up on the Jaguar. And so they came up like another $4,000. And I said, you know what? I got to think about this. Let me come back tomorrow. Um, Cause here's the price I really want. And they said, the manager won't be here until tomorrow. I said, great, I'll come back tomorrow. So before I went in, I called the Jaguar dealership and asked them what price they would give me. And they gave me $55,000, which is what I thought I should get. And so I went into the Toyota dealership and I told them, I'm not going to sell you guys a Jaguar cause you're not going to do the 55,000. So they gave me the keys of the Jaguar. I went over to the Jaguar dealership and sold it to the Jaguar dealership for $55,000. But I had already gotten the Tacoma with the $10,000 markup off. So I was able to understand the numbers and use my leverage and understand how they were bundling things together, move them into separate deals to be able to negotiate down a better deal. And you know what? No one said anything to me. No one got mad. No one kicked and screamed. Why? Because everyone still got paid. The dealership made money. I got the $10,000 wiped off. The salesperson made money. Everyone still made money. And I do think, because they did make a comment to me later, they said, well, you are lucky that we've had another exact same truck because we probably wouldn't have done that deal if that was the only one here on the lot. And I said, yeah, I understand. I got lucky. But I also knew what I was doing. I understood the numbers. I knew the market. I knew how everything worked. I knew to separate it into different deals. I paid attention to what was going on and used everything that I revealed to you guys in this podcast, okay? So everything I talked to you about today can help you. And I know we focus mainly on homes, cars, and jewelry, but you can use this in, in a little bit of construction, but you can use this with construction jobs, remodeling, jewelry, homes, cars, even coaching programs, even if you're looking for another job, or even if you're an employee, you can still use this, right? So you have to figure out your leverage. If you're an employee and you wanna raise, or you wanna make more money, one of the best pieces of leverage you can have is how you make the company more money. Like if one of my employees came to me and was like, hey, I want a raise of $20,000 and here's what I'm gonna do to bring in another $100,000 of value to the, to the company and they laid out a plan, I'd be stupid not to give them that raise. Watch all my employees come to me tomorrow. Hey, Brandon, um, <laughs> here's how I'm gonna add $100,000 to the company. Can we have a raise? Um, but I would be stupid not to do that, right? So again, use everything that we talked about today and I promise you, you guys will start to save money on a lot of deals you won't be taken advantage of. And it will be fun. Look at this as a game. So hopefully you enjoyed this episode. It was uh, an episode I love putting together. It's one of my passions of, of negotiating. I just love looking at how I can work the numbers. And I just, I don't know, maybe I'm a freak and I'm just one of those people that loves it. I hated it. I was an introvert. I was so scared out of my mind to negotiate in the past. And uh, I flipped everything around. And um, 
I love it. And I want to share that with you guys today. So hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, let me know by DMing me or tagging us on Instagram. And uh, I'll see you on another episode of the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast. Take care, everyone. Hey, guys, thank you so much for checking out another episode of the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, go below, hit the subscribe button, and make sure you click on that bell icon and get notified every time we drop a new episode. Now, if you're looking for the show notes, we have them linked underneath this video, as well as our social media handles and some links to free training and offers that we drop from time to time to help you guys even further. So go check those out if you're interested. And thank you so much for tuning in to the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast.